So yeah. Okay. Well, um, well, welcome everybody to um to, to this <coughs> excuse me this webinar, um, which is rather rather sadly the final webinar of our series that we've been running in conjunction with the um, CSA network and the Seed Sovereignty Program of UK and Ireland, and um. Uh, uh, and earlier initially for the Land Workers Alliance, which we've been doing these, these for the last two years, and they've been funded by Farming the Future, which has been brilliant. So they've been yeah, then tr normally the last Wednesday of of um, of the month, but um, of course, sort of Christmas meant that we've brought this one forward a bit. Um, but yeah, no, it's been fantastic to have the have that funding and to be able to do this and have this collaboration with the other organisations. Which I've, I hope that if you've been on a few of these before, I hope you've um, found found them useful. Um, and we've also got a good good backlog of resources um, on on the um, on the website of of all three organisations or four organisations that we the um, which of past webinars to 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 uh, look at at your your leisure. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, just as to reiterate, if you want to introduce yourself on the chat to people, other people on the call, and if you've uh, got questions, then please put to our panelists and put them to the Q into Q and A. Um, I'm Phil Sumption from the from the OGA, and we're running this this um, this webinar. And um, and and we've the subject is winter brassicas for continuity, and that's a, a subject which came up you know, quite quite recently. We were wondering how what the final one we were going to what subject we were going to do, but it seems to be people have had some issues this year with this extraordinary um, kind of um, sort of roller coaster of uh, of a season that we've been having from sort of from drought to um, really mild warm. Um, autumn and now now to the cold snap so how can you grow brassicas in uh, given given climate change given all the um the increased unpredictability of of the climate how can you plan for continuity and i very very pleased to to welcome um on onto the call um john overwarder who will who will kick who will kick us off i'll introduce him first and then i'll introduce jez but um uh, John um, is a plant raiser at, at Delflands, and what he doesn't know about about um, scheduling brassicas then then is probably not 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 worth knowing. So um, it's he's he is um, very very experienced plant plant grower, and he has written articles for us on on scheduling different brass brassicas in the, in the past for the Organic Grower magazine. And um, yeah, very, very, very pleased to have him and his experience at our our sort of disposal tonight. And to balance that, we've got we've got Jess Jess Taylor from from Dalesford, who I've also known for for a very long time actually, um, since since the nineties when we uh, were both growing together at um, at Ralph and Mill in. You're my boss, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I was. But uh, it's great to see you. You know, you're you're still you're still growing and doing doing growing so so well and doing such fantastic work at Dalesford, um, and and low number. Your name came up a number of times. People said, you know, um, people. If you want someone who is um, who does brassicas well, then then um, Jez. Is, oh, wow. is your man so wow. very pleased to have Je jez on jez on board and um he'll give a sort of grower's perspective um and of kind of uh tweaking tweaking the team uh, like a captain or a football manager tweaking his team which is very appropriate on a night for the um of, <laughs> of the world cup semi-finals so um thank you jez for joining us um and um we've also got lizzie here uh lizzie horton who's um it's sort of going to help with with uh um, rounding up some of the question, questions as we go go through and some of the tech support. So, uh, with no further ado, I'm going to ask um, ask John to um, to 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 kick us off. Yeah, thank you, Phil, um, for that very kind introduction. It was uh, not really deserved, but anyway, hi, here we go. Um, I've been asked to talk about um, continuity of brassicas. Uh, when Phil first asked me, I uh, wrote down milder winters, less risk of frost killing the plants, <laughs> autumns are milder, plants will get ready quicker, um, which is after after the last week we've had, um, it's totally 
thrown that one out of the window. Um, first of all, I was planning to do a little bit about physiology of plants. Um, first of all, when you sow a seed um, and get it germinated, the plant goes through a juvenile phase. And by juvenile phase, I mean um, whatever happens to it at that stage, it will not flower. Um, the juvenile phase lasts for different lengths of time in different varieties. Um, for example, if you have a long juvenile phase, the production of the brassica will be later, uh, assuming it's a flowering brassica like uh, Calabrese, cauliflower, um, purple, purple sprouting broccoli. Um, so you have a juvenile phase. When the plant has gone through the juvenile phase, it then needs, it, it may well need a stimulus to flower. Um, and that could be, um, or it could, that could very well be um, a frost period or uh, just the day length improving or the light intensity improving. So take, if I go with cauliflowers um, for the autumn period, if you, you, all the autumn varieties go through a juvenile phase and then produce a curd. Um, so that you can quite easily plant a lot of diff a lot of different varieties and all on the same day and end up with curds going from let's say you planted them on the first of July the curd they would start hearting up from um, beginning of October right the way through till December, when it starts getting tricky. Um, so that's all about which variety you plant. Um, if you want to try and get plants ready in December, January and February, you, are put it, you have to put the same varieties in, but put them in on a regular basis. So let's say you choose, um, uh, let's say a variety called Bellot, which is um, an Elson's variety. To get continuity, to, to get even a chance of getting continuity during that period, you would be planting that one, um, let's say every seven days through July and halfway through August. And then you stand a chance of getting um, getting some cauliflower continuity. But obviously, when it freezes like this, um, it's going to kill cauliflowers. Um, but in a normal winter, um, it will kill the cauliflower curd if it freezes really badly. But as long as the cauliflower initiation is only small, it will carry on and grow after that. Um, then you get to the overwintered cauliflowers, the, the, the Roscoff varieties and, and the Walchen varieties. Uh, they will carry on growing over winter. They will, you will plant them in July. They will grow until sometime, let's say December, when they get either they, they need increasing light intensity and then they will initiate a curd. Um, so the ones that are early, let's say the ones that get ready in March will have initiated early and the ones that get ready in um, May, even June will have initiated later because the they either haven't passed the juvenile phase or they haven't added enough cold units to initiate the flowers. But the overwintered ones are a lot easier 
if you choose, let's say, ten, five or ten varieties from the same seed house, they are very likely to come in a reasonable sequence. Okay. Um, the other thing I found out when I was looking on the internet is that some varieties, when the temperature gets above 23 degrees centigrade, they don't initiate. So you've got to be careful with that. If I go on to purple sprouting broccoli, um, there's for summer production, going into the winter, there's a very good variety called burgundy, um, which will harvest, I don't know, from probably June right the way through till now. And, and I did pick some out of my garden, although they were um, covered in frost. I got them yesterday. Um, right, so then you need an early winter type um, Red Admiral used to be very good. I don't know if you can get it anymore. And uh, Riocus quite good. If you plant, right. Go back one step. Burgundy, you can carry on planting till middle of August. And the middle of August will get ready about now. Um, if you want to go with Red Admiral or Rioca, you want to be planting it late June to get it ready now and into January, February, March. And then if you want to get from March, April and May, you'll be planting other varieties, um, but you'll plant them in July, right the way through to the 1st of August. They get ready um, with frost fertilization, with cold period, uh, purple sprouting broccoli. Um, so, for example, burgundy won't need hardly any cold at all to um, initiate its flowers, and it, it just carries on doing it all summer. Whereas, if you were talking about Red Admiral or Rioja, they probably need a short, a very, um, they might even just need 10 degrees to initiate the flowers. Um, but as you get further into the uh, winter period, about, sorry, when you're trying to harvest in um, right the way up to May, so March, April and May, then they will require more cold period. I have planted claret as a young plant in the middle of um, August and had no, but it was then not past its juvenile phase when it went into the winter and it didn't produce any uh, purple, sprout, uh, purple sprouts. And it was looking like it was going to do it one year later because it didn't it was planted too early sorry it was planted too late and didn't get its cold fertilization period right um cabbages <clears throat> pointed cabbages seem to be fairly easy you can keep planting them all the year round um but you will, all, you will have to plant a lot in September in order. To, so the first week of September will get ready before Christmas. The last week of September will get ready uh, after Christmas. So if you're planting, um, you want to be planting all September to try and get a, a spread. Probably better to plant more in the early part of September. Um, because you will have, they will, they'll stand really well in the cold weather. Um, if I go on to ordinary cabbage, yeah, you, you, you're on the same sort of principle, but you, can't, you have to stop planting 
well, at least the first week of August. Um, and probably uh, quicker than that depends on where you are in the country. Um, interesting for savoy cabbages, there, um, there's, there's some quite modern new varieties um, that heart up from it. it the old fashioned varieties would produce um, a wrap leaf, let's say the size of a, a very small football, and then gradually fill in the middle. Whereas some of the newer varieties start tennis ball size quite hard and then just carry on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and there, that means it's useful because if you're selling them, uh, you can sell them at, I don't know, but small ball right the way up to a, a big ball size and you've still got quite a solid solid cabbage whereas the some of the older varieties uh, will get will fill up the um the space and then split um which isn't any good so um um Romanesque cauliflower. Um, you could plant that from March. There's varieties now that will plant from March right the way through till mid July. And that will harvest all the way up to Christmas. But it is susceptible to, to frost this um, um, Romanesque cauliflower. There, but Interestingly enough, there's a, um, a Romanesque cauliflower now that behaves like an overwintered cauliflower and will get ready in March and April. Um, but that sort of sat on its own as a, there's, there's, the breeders have bred them to get ready over winter, but in my experience, it only needs a small amount of frost and uh, it really does make a mess of them. And this weather will just finish them off, I think. Um, yeah, so that. And the last, the last one is, um, well, no, not the last one. Um, Calabrese, there doesn't seem to be a lot of variation between varieties in terms of maturity. If you plant Calabrese, I think the best you can hope for is if you plant two varieties, the best you can hope for is about three weeks between the first one getting ready, the early variety getting ready and the late variety getting ready. So most people plant two varieties and plant um, once a fortnight, once every three weeks, and then they will have to go over the field and get the um, the calabrises to get ready. Um, but you can't, there isn't the varieties to get a huge spread of harvest like there is on the cauliflowers. Um, perhaps it will improve as it goes on. Um, and you can't get that far into the autumn. Um, the latest safe planting date for Calabrese in middle of England is about um, 1st of August. Um, I planted later and, and got Calabrese. Uh, and, but if you start planting in the middle of August, to the end of August, or you, and you manage to get them ready without the frost getting them, um, they'll only be small anyway because they won't build a big frame um, before they're ready. Um, so, if you want Calabrese uh, coming up to the, let's say, all November, you want to be planting at the end of July um, to the first week, well, not even for the first day of August, you'd call it your last planting. Um, you need, if you can get varieties that don't get um, 
are less susceptible to the wet, windy weather in, in autumn. That helps. But it gets risky trying to get calabrese in November and especially in December. Um, sprouts, sprouts. Um, plant lots of different varieties. Um, some are early, some middle, and some late. Um, look in your catalogues to find which ones are uh, good for um, sticks, sprout sticks, and which aren't. I would planting. I would be doing it um, middle middle of June if you can. Early May, beginning of June. Oh, sorry, early June, begin middle of June. Um, but they are susceptible at that time of year to getting um, eaten by the flea beetle. So uh, if you you need to cover them or be no know, know that you're not going to get so much flea beetle. Um, you, so in other words, continuity of them is down to variety. Maybe. Uh, kale. Um, from my experience, kale will always go to seed in March and April. So you could plant kale, I don't know, let's say in March, and it will carry on getting bigger and bigger and bigger until next March, April, when it goes to seed. So if you can keep it, you keep it alive and, and it will get to about four or five foot high. But if you plant it, that's assuming you're just taking leaves off it. Um, but if you were just chopping the head off and selling it as a headed uh, kale, um, you could carry on planting it till September. And, but the, the good thing about kale is you could just carry on breaking leaves off as and when you need them for, for marketing. But if you start planting after September, you won't get a big enough plant to mark it very much off, off, your, uh, off your plant. So, um, I think at that point, that's all I've got written down. I'm quite happy to answer uh, questions. Um, I think, I um, I, yeah, thank, thank you very much, John. Um, yeah. I, I, I think we'll leave the majority of questions to, to, the, to after, after um, Jez, Jez has um, given the, um, a bit of a, a chat but there we have one one question which is a, a sort of point of clarification from kate and um, and that says when john when you're talking about brassicas is this um uh, about planting brassicas is this planting out a reasonably sized module um if so are sowing times approximately six weeks earlier for those who are not buying in plants yes Pro approximately six weeks earlier um five to six weeks it depends how fast you grow them yeah um, okay. it depends on the nutrition in the module basically and there's a question where you are in 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 the in the country so you know, yeah Cambridgeshire. Cambridgeshire, yes but we deliver plants all over but the south west seems to plant stuff an awful lot later I mean, as in three weeks later than would you, um, somebody in Yorkshire, for example. So, uh, and the middle of England tends to be colder than the the coasts of England as well. So they would adjust their planting dates. But if you had a crystal ball to tell what the weather was going to do, it would be a lot easier. But um, without a crystal ball, mm. um, the, the other thing I, I, I should mention, if you... If you are um, trying to get a continuity and you've ordered, let's say, um, six trays from the propagator, if you plant one tray every week of them six, assuming it's the same variety, you can get a continuity by doing that as well. So you don't have to keep choosing lots of different varieties. You can spread your planting most people want to take their plants and plant them today because it might rain tomorrow. Mm. But <laughs> if, if you 
if you keep planting on a regular basis every four or five days or something like that or even every week that's a good way of getting continuity off a batch of plants okay i've just got one more question on the q a before we go to jez and that's just um about about planting kale and um, Alex says I am curious to know when in September would be your last planting date for kale we're, we're in Kent in September um I would say uh, about the 20th something like that depends yeah 20th 20th go for the 20th okay the, 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 the thing is the later you, the, the later you plant it, the, the smaller the your yield will be. So it's not about cutting kale; it's about how big a yield of kale you want. So if you want a big yield, you you want to be planting them in July, but you can carry on planting them and still pick a head of kale, but it won't weigh a lot. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Um, we'll we'll come back to 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 you, John, with more questions after um, mm. a, a bit a bit of an introduction to um, brassica growing at um, Dalesford from Jess. Thank you. Yeah, hello, hello, all you wonderful assistant uh, organic growers out there. Uh, what a delight to share with you my kind of little planning schedule of how to make the most money out of my seven <laughs> acres of brassicas. Because uh, that's what it is. It's like 20 years of fine tuning and being frustrated by wastage. Um, the, when you only have like um, a quarter, based on a four year rotation, a quarter of your land to commit to your brassicas, and they're the biggest vegetable family that we have at our disposal, you kind of get very frustrated when you have wastage situations. So those crops that uh, you're relying on a certain size head, um, I've kind of left them. Cauliflowers, I've had it. I've had it with cauliflowers. I've loved growing cauliflowers. I've loved eating cauliflowers. I've loved growing Romanesco and how beautiful they are and Instagramming about bloody beautiful Fibonacci sequence looking <laughs> cauliflower shapes. But um, when you lose a proportion to the frost and you know you could have grown something else in that location and got something out of it, it puts you right off. So I no longer grow those. I no longer grow um, red cabbage and white cabbage because uh, they, the, the tenants split. And I, over the years, I have, I've ignored the spacing of 80 centimetres um, by 40 centimetres. I've always tried to shrink all the brassicas down to 60 centimetre spacing in a four row bed when you have 40 centimetres uh, centimetre between rows. And um, yeah, and then you don't get enough size of, of brass. You don't get big enough heads. So that's been very frustrating. So what John mentioned about those brassicas where you can just tear bits off and have a, a long, prolonged period of harvest, that's where I'm at. So for me, it's about um, principally about kale. Um, it's about sprouting broccoli. And even with Calabrese uh, varieties like um, Belt, Bell Star and Covina. I've been trying to select them to create extra periods of longer periods of availability through August, September into, into October. But they're quite unpredictable. And as John says, sometimes they can all they can come within seven days of each other. So that varietal selection didn't really work for me. And what I do find if you plant them late and they get frost and you've got a big curd, it gets ruined. So I've now left that kind of calories. I'm now interested in tender stem because I think that with less curd and more stem, you've got more resilience against frost and thus less wastage. And if you've got nimble pickers, then you can actually pick off tender stem up to three times, even in, in the autumn. Um, and we did a quite a late planting uh, in um, the end of July. And, that they've still come into December. We, we picked it yesterday, we frost on it, um, defrosted it in the shed today, and it was, it was actually fine. And I know for a fact, if that had been Bell Star, it would have gone all manky and translucent in the middle of the curd. So uh, yeah, and then we've got the, um, the, the sprouts, the Brussels sprouts, you've got to have those. 
uh, and care less. But um, I just um, I'm going to ask Phil to pull up my um, my success, succession of uh, of brassicas for the winter. We um, what we have done in historically as growers, we get very excited when we see our Tamar catalogue and we get the Alsom's list and we get, get all excited about varieties. But as you get into being a bigger player and you end up being employed by somebody else who gives you money to, to buy plants, you get less tempted to, to grow all your own brassicas. And it makes huge sense to use propagators like John. Uh, I, I actually never used John for producing my brassicas. I've used historically Wessex plants who are more local to me in Bristol. They no longer exist. So now I'm using uh, Richard Grant plants in Peterborough. Um, and I have allowed my propagators to, to direct me on the varieties I choose. Um, and through that, I've actually learned a lot more about useful varieties because I've always based, I tend to always base my varieties around what the Tamar catalog suggests. Um, but the propagator will be playing with bigger players who, who are reliant on hybrid varieties, mainly from Holland and Germany, that have got more consistency of size. And, and you come to realise in the course of time that more consistency of size is really useful, especially if you move into wholesale, because if you want 12 cauliflowers or cabbages the same size to fit in a box, then it's really annoying when 40% of your crop is smaller or bigger, so you don't get 12 in a box. It sounds pedantic and pathetic, and it's the source of all the food wastage that goes on in the world, but in the course of time, you, can, you kind of value consistently sh shaped and, and sized heads, units of, of, of crop. Uh, and when you're doing a box scheme, it can be quite complicated to pass on that information to members of staff. Okay, you give one decent sized cabbage to an individual or two small ones. And it's very hard to get the two small ones to be the same size. Anyhow, let's look at this list. So yeah, I would have planted some brassicas before this. I would have planted kale. Kale's big for us at Dalesford. We have this, we have this, we're supplying kitchens and we're supplying um, uh, farm shops, retail stores. We've got five stores, we've got cafes. And the, they do this kale salad, and kale is fundamentally important in this salad, and it's very popular. It's the biggest selling salad. They also sell a lot of meat. It's all about pasture-fed meat, our business, and we're just the garnish in the business, to be honest. And kale is used as a garnish on the meat counters. So the more expensive your meat, the more kale they will use in between the meat to sell it. So we sell a lot of kale just for garnishing meat counters. That sounds a little bit cynical, but hey, I don't care. I'm getting bucks for selling this stuff and it, it's got to look fresh, it's got to look good. And, and other people get into that as well. And, and it works, you know, it works. It helps to sell this great pasture fed meat. Anyhow, I'm off the track. Let's go on to the sprouts at the beginning. So the sprouts, red cabbage and carelets, they're the longest season brassicas in my selection. I don't want to plant more than one variety. I don't want to plant it twice. I've planted Nautic and Doric before. I've never really noticed any huge advantage planting Nautic. I mean, I'm, like, like John says, depends where you are. I'm in the middle of the country. It's kind of, it's quite good. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, but Nautic, it's supposed to, I guess Nautic is November and Doric D, December. I've always thought that's how they came up with those different varietal names. Mm -hmm. But um, this year, I mean, the sprouts have actually had so many accumulated day degrees of growing energy from the sun and the heat. As long as you've had the water to go with that, all the kind of sprouts are grown. They're, they're huge. They're like three and a half, four foot tall, with great woody stems, um, beautiful button all the way up. I mean, I've lost probably about 15, 20 percent on half the plants just because they got too big at the bottom. So, um, and we've been harvesting them since uh, the second week of November. Um, and ideally we would go back to them twice. So we'd harvest the lower part of the, the stem and then the top part. So if you've got a good variety that, that can grow and fill the stem, then that top that over the, 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 over the growing season, which 
should be from June, essentially until the end of October. And that top part of the, the stem will slowly thicken up and give you extra opportunities right the way into, into February if you're prepared to, to hang out with the sprouts and, uh, and, and that's what you want. If you want sprouts for that period of time. To be honest, my experience of box schemes and within our own business, which has got basically a kitchen is just as important as the retail element. When you have a menu that ch changes eight times a year, a year, you don't necessarily get such huge sales for a particular ingredient past a certain period. So currently we've got this sprout, shredded sprout salad in the kitchens. We're only doing sprouts for the kitchen. And we're doing about 200 kilos a week. And um, we've done that since early November. Uh, but by the time we get into January, they'll be off. And so that is our succession. Our succession, we will change the menu to something else. And the KLF is coming to our lives. And if you haven't had a go at it, have a go at it. It's amazing. We're incredibly vigorous, really reliable, consistent set of um, flowering buttons on the stem. And they will hang till March. So we kind of evolved the menu so that we move on to Kalets after sprouts. And that's so it's kind of like it's not necessarily spreading, creating succession, but it's more about offering your customers different brassicas at different times of the season and acknowledging which brassicas match which part of the season well. Okay. Uh, let's look at the uh, June, third week of June. So, um, hang on, someone's just asked, what do I make of cutting off top of sprout plants? Never done that, but I have seen it on the YouTube. Yeah, never done it. I always think I want to sell the sprout tops and make an extra buck out of that. Unfortunately, when you get a cold spell, all the pigeons turn up and trash and crap all over your sprout top. So I often miss out on that opportunity. But what I have noticed that uh, the Kalets are less, the pigeons are less interested in Kalets. And I don't know whether that's because there's a distraction in the sprouts and, and like kale and cavolo that they'll rather go to, or because the Kalets are so tall, they're awkward to perch on. But generally the Kalets get less pigeon damage than than any of my other winter brassicas. Yeah, discuss later. Okay, let's look at the Cavalo. Cavalo, Cavalo Nero. Where were we before the diversity in kales that Cavalo Nero offered us? I don't know. I actually find Cavalo Nero more sexy and exciting to use than kale. Don't know. Yeah, I will <laughs> put it into any kind of hot saucy dish i will put into stir fries omelets off the stem yeah I, I i i thoroughly enjoy using it it's a big deal for us and so rather than planting uh, uh savoy cabbages for autumn in that ju late june period i will plant cavalo nero with the intention of starting to harvest it in october uh, we'll plant more in july as well uh, but as long as it does, as long as you keep it happy, well watered, it did succumb to a bit of white fly this year, but it didn't get any um any mildew, which you can get if you get too big a um a kale or, or cavalo plant. Uh, and yeah, that yeah. So anyway, uh, the a high proportion of ground I will commit to cavalo, uh, as well as the kale and the tempestem. And then you've got the um. um the kale, well, I've already mentioned the kale. I can never have got enough kale. I always need kale. I would apply 10,000 kale back in April to see me good in the earlier part of the season. But the sprouting broccoli, now that is a big gig for us. But at certain times of year, you have hero crops. And hero crops in the spring, as you come just, as, just before the hunger gap, it's all about the sprouting broccoli. Now the Burbank is white sprouting broccoli. Um, and I can't rank it high enough. I think it's fantastic, really vigorous, uh, lots of cropping opportunities, the latter end of the season. And you'll notice in that list, I haven't got any of the early varieties because I've been frustrated by these sexy new hybrid varieties that always have a massive head 
rather than sprouting immediately into lots of small shoots. Often that big, nice head just gets ruined by frost. It doesn't get ruined by frost, it gets ruined by pigeons. It doesn't get ruined by pigeons, it gets ruined by the mesh that rubs on it when you try and protect them from the pigeons. So anyway, I'm kind of moving more towards just from February, mid-February into late April into May. But as the years have gone by, it seems that it gets quite hot late, uh, mid-late April these days, and the sprouting broccoli rarely lasts beyond um, beyond the end of April. It doesn't really go into May. Okay, and then go <coughs> also in that um, July, um, second week of July planting, red Russian kale. Why do I love red Russian kale so much? I always plant it then, yet I always find that it gets mildew because it gets it's too vigorous and it's got such thin leaves and there's so many of them. I guess it just gets stressed and the outer leaves get mildew. However, if you keep them wet enough, I mean, you could you could you could plant them in the fourth week of July. I could easily change where well, I plant them. But red Russian kale is fant is my one of my it's my favourite kale because I mean, we've been hard selling it as um, bunched heads uh, for the last few weeks. But then as you get into the spring and all the heads have been taken off, the regrowth from pretty much um, late January, if you've got mixed leaf salad as one of your products, you can harvest uh, the regrowth on the stems and add it to the mixed leaf. Now you can do that with the tops of, of, of curly kale or cavolo, but they're a little, they're, they're a bit rough really, they're a bit, a bit coarse, but with the with the red Russian, you've got that, it's just a really, it's the most tender of all kale. It's like the baby leaf spinach of kale. <clears throat> and suddenly something which is selling for £3.50 on the head, the kilo, when you're harvesting it as a small growth off the stem of, of the plant, then it becomes £10 a head. So you've got, if, you, if you've got five kilos going into a 50 kilo mix, then you can quite easily lose this, what was quite a, this rudimentary leaf crop, you can lose it into your mixed leaf and it becomes really quite valuable. And then it does it another thing, when it goes to shoot, as all brassicas do, come the end of March, you can sell it as um, sprouting red Russian. I mean, we do a similar thing with the, with the Cavalo Nero and sell it as sprouting Cavalo Nero, but the red Russian is just so vigorous. And I guess because I have that early planting date it has such an established root system when it does kick off with all its shoots you get masses per plant and you can pretty much on the two foot spacing um you, you, you can you can get a whole bunch per plant maybe twice in that march to april period and then yeah the late the late july comments of more ten stem savoy cabbage yes i have i'm still interested in cabbages because Savoy doesn't seem to split. I mean, January King, that's always been something that uh, I've been encouraged to grow lots of because it's, it's available in January. And everybody wants to have a kind of relevant seasonal menu. And January King pretty much says, I want to be on your menu in January. Now, <clears throat> it's all very well, but it's always perfect to pick in bloody October, <laughs> by the time you get to January, it's split. So again, I've wasted a lot of space on January King, which I've lost, to be, to be honest. So as John mentioned, I hadn't realised, but Savoy cabbage, that's fine, I don't need that one now. Sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, Savoy cabbage, it doesn't split. And so that is where, that, that's the only cabbage I'm interested in. I'm interested in, you may notice the next one, the September one, the spring greens opportunity. And uh, we'll chuck a load of those in as well. But it's the Savoy cabbage that I am that I will be having a relationship with in the future. I'm not bothered about my red cabbage, my white cabbage, um, uh, or the January King. It's just going to be a Savoy. I'm quite happy to have multiple uh, plantings and I will probably I can spread I know that if I plant this late as September with the spring greens that they would just overwinter 
and slowly fatten up in the spring. And they're, they're easy to cover as well. Because they're low lying, you can get your mesh on them. Whereas the whole idea of meshing sprouting broccoli is just, it's just painful and it hurts and it ruins the crop. So that's all about the scary man, okay? I haven't got one yet, but look it up on YouTube. It's gonna be amazing as soon as they start to put some interesting sounds that go with it. The inflatable orange scary man, everyone. Get one of them. <laughs> I'm gonna invest in it. Uh, so anyway, so that there you go. That that's my um that's my that's my list, that's my schedule. I don't know if you want to put the other list up. This year I I'm involved with our other farm, which is up in Staffordshire. And this list, I've I've kind of I've put this list together and it's one planting day uh, on six, seven acres. And it's, it's an attempt at a list of brassicas to one hit wonder, to try and supplement what I do at Dalesford with brassicas on, the other, on this other location in Staffordshire. And you'll notice there's broccoli, there's cauliflower, there's pointy cabbage, there's, there's white cabbage, different types of red cabbage, different sprouts. <clears throat> uh, and I've even got uh, swede on there, which um, again, is another one of those relatively long season brassicas. You kind of have to treat like a leafy brassica uh, as opposed to the turnips, which you kind of just drill. Uh, and I've got hungry gap kale on in there. Um, the hungry gap kale is a uh, it's a sheep kale, but it's kind of really tender, akin to red Russian kale. And I've come to, I don't know how I ended up growing that up, but it literally does what it says on the tin and it comes, it doesn't bolt until all the others bolted. And when you've got the requirement for kale <clears throat> pretty much all year round, then that is the one to go for. And again, you can use the regrowth in salads as well. Um, it's a delightful, it's a delightful thing. Lots of secondary heads um, rather than just the big glamorous palm tree like the curly kale that you have. But yeah, that, that list there, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it's all pretty well, uh, I shouldn't tell you the story, but unfortunately we planted them. And then uh, a herd of cows got in the field a month after they'd been planted. So uh, yeah. Only the kale and cavolo have come good, which is really upsetting. But I intend to do something like this next year as well to create a long period of brassica supply, um, ideally from one planting. But as you know, Philip and John, that is pretty, that's pretty hard to pull off. That is pretty hard to pull off. And um, yeah, so, but I, I, but you don't, you don't, you, you can, you always go back. Every, as growers, we kind of we, we, we kind of sulk on a crop for a few years. We go, oh, I'm not going to do that again. And then you go, ah, well, actually, the things seem to have changed. I'll, I'll give it another go. And that's what this list is. It's me giving white cabbage, red cabbage, Nautic, um, broccoli, cauliflower, another go. But unfortunately, we were ruined by cows. So um, I'm looking forward to that, doing that again. Um, I'd be interested to, to know more about the winter savoys, John, which, um, which you'd recommend. Stanton is one that I've grown before, which is a kind of cross between a savoy and a green headed cabbage. Uh, it, it looks really good. It looks like it holds really well. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's my list, guys. That, that, that's my succession. Um, I don't make all my money out of those. I, I make much more money out of my salad brassicas. Um, we're still doing 50 kilos of salad, mixed leaf salad twice a week. So that, that, those are the brassicas that um, I get really excited about. But these cooking greens, if you're doing, running a box scheme, if you have um, a restaurant, if you have a farm, uh, farmer's market stall, you always want to have two or three greens up your sleeve. Um, but I just feel that <clears throat> with the headed of it types, 
particularly cauliflowers and calabrese, I'm not, I, 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 I'm, I don't want to take the risk anymore. I think that's, yeah, that's what I'm feeling. I love cauliflower. Weirdly, I've become more and more into cauliflower and using cauliflower, but I don't want to do it anymore. Too many sad days. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can vouch for that. It's not an easy crop, but those who do it can do it well. But yeah, yeah. Um, great. Well, thank you very much, Jez. That's that, that was that, that was brilliant. We've got a few we've got a few questions. So um, let's. So the first the first one here, and I guess that's I mean, that's for for both of you. Any suggestions about pest management for sprouts? I had big issues with aphids this year. Aphids. Yeah, well, I had big issues with, with aphids. Um, all I can say is that I'm very lucky to have water. Uh, and from middle of August, I put the irrigation on the sprouts at least every three weeks. Uh, that did help. Although I think all of us have experienced like uh, incredible aphids this year. The, John mentioned it last night, the, the kind of grey aphid it consumed whole plants this year and tolly always used to say occasionally you have certain uh, plants within a group that will just succumb to pests and you just let it go you will we'll, we'll pull them up um but i mean i always say that all this is down to it's all down to stress and because the plants were so big this year because they had that extra growing opportunity or that extra sun and heat when it comes to September, the, the demands for water are, are, are much more than we're used to. And that's why we're all experiencing really bad um, white fly and, and aphid. Weirdly, the stuff that was growing up north in Staffordshire had no white fly and aphid in it because they have more rainfall up there. So you, you can't really, you just have to water more. I mean, and where you get plants that are completely like, devastated by the stuff just rag them out it creates more space for the the other ones around it and they'll do well from it i i got quite a lot of um um if it early on i think it's about not enough predators kicking around when the aphid population starts building up i was putting uh, i'm lucky i've, I've got a, uh, i netted my brassica patch to keep the pigeons off it and um i get predators onto the nursery so i was letting predators go underneath the nets and like jess said i lost three or four plants because i couldn't get enough water on my garden with complete aphid infestations um they just they were just rubbish um but the rest of them um came through it reasonably well um, and especially things like purple sprouting broccoli because it's in that it just suddenly bursts out of the of the green area and the aphids don't get a chance to catch up with it so much but once we got into the rainy season my aphids got less of a problem but I did have a lot of predators on them yeah, I found all the all the aphids were washed off um, once all that rain happened in October. Mm. I mean, I was I was quite I was getting quite upset about it all in in September, but by the by the end of October, I was like, oh, we're, we're, over, so that, we're over that hump. Yeah, not so bad, not so bad. But I in it, when it were during that hot period, I couldn't keep anything growing. Everything just sat there, even though I was watering it, but not watering it enough. Um, and then all of a sudden it all set off and started growing when the rain arrived and continuity went out the window. I was giving stuff away left, right and centre. This is out my garden, <laughs> which is only, you know, a postage stamp basically. But I tend to, I tend to put all the new varieties in my garden and, and anybody who's planting stuff late on the schedule, I stick that in the garden. And um, so I'm starting to learn how far I can push varieties out of the comfort zone and um, or out of the catalog recommendations. Let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, 
So I, I tend to learn quite a lot out of my garden, um, but I'm not good at it. <laughs> so. Okay. What's thanks. your um, what's your go to red cabbage variety, John? It what, was. What do your What do your growers always want to grow? It was Buscar Buscaro. Yeah, I agree with that. We've got it's, split. it's now Climaro. Okay. Kilmara, Climaro, yeah. Cl Climaro. But if I'm sticking stuff in my garden, I always stick some uh, Integro in for an early one. Just, but it's Climaro now. Right. Okay, we've got a question here from Jim, Jim Applin. Um, no, Jim. Yeah, and um, he ha he says, how early would you go with winter green for spring greens, September on? Winter green. I can barely, green. I can barely get them to. I mean, this September has been such a great growing September that everything has fattened up quite well under a mesh, and they're going to be. I, I'm pretty confident they're going to be great. Um, come the end of February, well, they won't, they'll be, it'll be, it'll be late March, I guess, then when they'll be worth it. But um, was it the question, how late or how early? How early would you go with wintergreen? Oh, I would probably, well, through my experience, I would probably say that I'm not early enough and I probably need to go mid-August. Okay. Extra. I grow plants for a customer who cuts greens to feed aphids uh, feed, sorry to feed <laughs> to feed feed locusts right strange strange niche in the market and he is planting in well march as soon as he can get going and he carries on planting till september and he's plant he's not planting just winter green but he's planting greens varieties so there would be um uh, winter supreme and winter supreme plus and winter green he does winter green on over winter so um if you wanted greens all the year round it's a doable thing but you have to pick them quick well not quick but they will end eventually heart up um Elson's have got a greens variety, which has got really big leaves, if big leaves is what you're after. Um, and um, give me a minute, I'll tell you <laughs> what variety it is. I think it begins with the um, uh, verve, the verve it's called, but it's, it's um, bulks up quite well, but the leaves are quite big. John, when you when you do um, spring greens, because as a as somebody who hasn't really who as a customer of spring greens in the past, before I got into growing them, mm. would you multi sow them so that you? I guess it depends on your spacing, but mm. would, could you multi sow them so that you get say three small heads so that you then put them straight into a bag? Or would you just or give them like? Um, 40 centimetre spacing, 40 by 40 centimetre spacing. Has not, anybody not, ever not, not, None of my customers have ever asked for it. Right. It probably would work, but probably would work. Two in a block. I wouldn't put three in. Right. Two probably. And then you could cut two at once and go for a bag. Um, You've probably got more experience because every now and again you get a double in the planted two in a yeah 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 you're right it's more about just treating them like lettuce rather than like big cabbages so just shorten yeah. the spacing yeah i yeah. think i think i've i've had a few errors because i probably squeezed um a second brassica crop out of a piece of brassica rotation when i've grown spring greens so I yeah. may have had an early pointed cabbage crop or a tender stem crop, got like flailed it off, got recultivated, yeah. then planted um, the the spring greens. And the error I think is that uh, you kind of you spent the soil quite a bit already. 
And so it's quite okay. hard for that soil to, to come through the winter and give again um, as late as March uh, to, I, to get something to really bulk up well. I think planting spring green close together, you get less hearts. Is right that now. what you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It doesn't heart up so much, it will heart up in the end. But you get more leaves. If you want hearts, you grow wider apart. Yeah. Pointed cabbage hearts, as I would call them. Yeah. Okay, um, we've got um, a question here, Jez, on what varieties of Savoy um, you're growing. Uh, I've only really grown Cantassa in the last few years. I'm pretty much guided by my propagator on that one. Um, but yeah, Cantassa, but I do, like I say, the Stanton, I would, which is the kind of Savoy hybrid. I quite like that one. I definitely uh, grow that again. That Stanton is good. Yeah. I've, I've, I've got a note in my catalog saying Cantassa, uh, when it runs out, start using Clarissa. Um, cause I think they're going to discontinue, uh, Cantassa might take a while, but I, so a lot of uh, Formosa for real early ones, but it will split. It, it just grows really fast um, early. Um, but like I say, it will split. And I use Peressa and um, Wintessa and Wirosa for late ones. Wirosa has been around for since I was a lad. And that winter, do it. that that winter Peressa, has that? Have you got much experience of that one? Uh, As in, what does that mean, winter Peressa? Does it mean it can take the cold and come good in the spring if it if it goes over? Yeah, the winter quite they, they, small. The, the the winter varieties in this case stand the frost. Yeah, um, I think if you planted Wirosa early, it would just get ready early, um, but. It would get ready in, I don't know, 100 days, for example. Um, but because you plant in Wirosa in, in July, it won't get ready till February, March, April the following year. Yeah. And it depends when you plant it. It's not day length controlled. It just, so if it gets a real warm autumn, it's going to get ready, ready reasonably early. If you get a cold autumn, it'll get ready in. Uh, uh, March, April, but they all go to seed eventually. <laughs> it's all right, we, we just so, start planting kale in April, it'd be fine. <laughs> it, eh? Yep, you'll be off again. Be off I mean, again. We, we do, I mean, I will use like um, fleece, frost protection fleece on an early kale crop to bring it on That's a couple a of weeks. Idea. I know Tolly hates that, but um, because he says that if you if you use fleece, you encourage all the weeds. But um, we've got one of those uh, new kind of springtime hose that's quite you just drag over everything. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it. But, but there is some good good heat weeding equipment out there because I've I've got one grower who doesn't doesn't hand hand hoe or weed any of his brassicas. He does it with his weeding machine all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it is doable. Yeah. Okay, sorry, getting distracted. Um, so um, there's a question. There's a question here from Max on um, how many years in a row you grow brassicas on the same land. Well, if you're organic, you have to have a rotation. God, and and, uh, and and well, um, and but but I mean, do you double crop in the same year on um, with your with your brassicas? Well, I mean. I've got, I Go I've got a customer who does. <laughs> mm. If he if he got an early crop and he gets it out in time, he'll replant it and get a late crop off it. So in other words, he's growing brassicas one year mm. on that field, not two years. Sorry, not. I've I've grown by accident brassicas in my garden three years in a row because I run out of space and I haven't had any problems. But you are asking for problems. If you keep doing it, something will go wrong. Yeah, I mean, we 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 grow mixed leaf salads are big thing. So if I have any spare ground, I would just put 
Rocket, Frills, Mustard and Mizuna uh, and possibly like Rudolph Radish on there as well. So I will be double double cropping, but it's a different type of um, nutrient demand when you're just growing to tiny leaf. It's not quite so nitrogen intensive, I guess. Okay, good. Uh, we've got a question here from Jossie. What would your be your suggestions for best open pollinated varieties? Um, trying to avoid F1 in our mar market garden as, as much as possible. Good for you. Respect. Uh, if you've got lots of energy and time, then, then open pollinated varieties are okay because you have to walk the crop more frequently. Um, obviously, Red Russian is an open pollinated variety and Cavallo Nero varieties, they're kind of, I mean, the Black Magic, I guess it's a hybrid, but the one that... Was, the, the open pollinated one is it's a very similar performance, just a thinner leaf. So chefs don't get quite so much leaf off it uh, when they strip it off the stalk. Uh, as, as when it comes to everything that's ahead, I've just kind of, like I say, you, you learn to want consistency, unfortunately. And so it's harder when you have certain issues that come up in your life, like finding staff during a COVID epidemic, um, then you you kind of you kind of know that having the hybrids makes it easier for you. Uh, but if you've got more time to harvest, then maybe that's then you don't have to worry about those kind of things. And the open pollinated varieties are particularly of um, the uh, green sprouting calabrese, for example, and the, the early sprouting and, and purple sprouting varieties from Tamar, they've always done. They're great, but they just produce uh, thinner shoots um, so that you get you get more shoots. That's more harvesting to do to make a, a bunch of sprouting, for example. Uh, it's, um, it's a difficult one because you, as you get older, you kind of, or less physical, although I would say, being grower keeps you younger and keeps you physical and it's being physical is a, is a pleasure and a joy and we're very lucky to be able to do that kind of thing because we've got great clothes to keep our keep us warm and happy um but it's so tempting to to be able to harvest more and, and to as you have a career be able to achieve more on a piece of ground so yeah I know the chat. I just hope that some seed companies are owned by nice multinational corporations. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's such a thing. Any thoughts, John, on OPs? Um, um, an F1 hybrid person because of the uniformity and the greater vigour. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, you just you get more for your more for bang for your buck. If 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 I was a Victorian um, and somebody brought a Vic, uh, an F1 hybrid and said, "Here, try this," I'd be growing the F1 hybrid because it's an improvement. They were always looking for improvement. And you know, we seem, we seem to be looking backwards to the um, open pollinated ones. Do you know what? It, <laughs> do you know what? When if you cultivate the ground, if you release carbon through cultivation, if you commit mm -hmm. yourself to preparing a piece of ground and setting it up for the season, you've got you've got a responsibility to get the best, the most out of that bit of ground. If you're going to spend that energy preparing that ground, you're going to go for those varieties that give you the most out of it. Mm -hmm. Now. Yes, if you had more time to pick, you could maybe like go for the OP varieties, and it might suit um, smaller scale um, no dig operations where you have more intensity in smaller areas and you don't have to travel so far. But as soon as you get into field scale, you're wandering around with carrying heavy boxes of produce and compacting ground and. Yeah, you want to make it all pay. You know, you need, you need to make that effort in in fuel, in in running the tractor to prepare the ground, and doing it all 
And that's why you come onto hybrids. And it's exactly the same with tomatoes and polytunnels. Uh, our Sakura tomato is so much better than any OP variety, which is prone to split. And so you, 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 and if you're going to invest in all that infrastructure, you need to choose varieties that make it worthwhile and make that area of ground as, as valuable as possible. Saving coming into this process. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I, I think I, open... I, I saved my own tomato seed, and I save them um, because tomato varieties don't seem to benefit so much from F one figure. So I'm I'm saving, but I don't commercially send them out. But my own personal tomatoes. I'm uh, saving the seed. So it's, it's a choice. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's, um, you know, with, it's fair to say with brassicas that, that, you know, they, um, there, there are some, some crops certainly where like, like Brussels sprouts where the, the open pollinated varieties just don't, just don't compare and don't it. compete. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, there is, there, we, there, there has been a, a lack of breeding that's gone into open pollinated varieties over over the years. So, you know, if they'd had the some of the attention that some of the F ones had, had, then we might have better varieties. And, and I think there's a lot of work being get, going on with um, for those that, that that are interested in in sort of dehybridization. Some of the using some of the genetics that is in the the, the highly bred varieties and kind of select, selecting for. For, for better OPs, so yeah. there, are, there is work going on. Um, but yeah. at the moment, you know that yeah, you, if you're a grower and especially if you're supplying supplying large scale, field scale, then you, you you need to have the best tools available to you. I think. Yeah, but to to if you're un open pollinated, um, Elson's Cavallo Nero is probably ten percent better than other Cavallo Neros. I've seen that in the field. Mm. And for example, Bolt Hardy is now, uh, Janice is the improved selection of Bolt Hardy. Um, so they're picking out the best of the Bolt Hardy beetroot um, and then multiplying that up. So there, there's, know a few examples of some good good practice there mm. but, but most of the breeding is in f1 hybrids and there's not enough like phil says there's probably not enough breeding in the open pollinated varieties but, there is some going on in europe but um yeah that's uh, it's you know it's a lot it's got a, a way to go yet yeah. it needs support yeah, but if you're um, Mon Monsanto, you can't make money out of open pollinated varieties because everybody pinches them off you. Yeah. So, you know. Okay, we've got a question here on from Jamie Stroud on um, on club root on club root management. It says we have club root in a lot of our land. We relied quite heavily on resistant varieties last year, which limited our choice a lot, but went down the heavy lying route to get pH above seven point two to suppress club root this year. Hedged our bets by using quite a lot of resistant stuff, even so, but it seemed like the lining was a success as we've had very little sign of club root in the susceptible stuff. Um, I'm hoping that uh, you, you haven't had experience of club root <laughs> in some ways, but um, any thoughts on, on club root? Um, uh, the, particularly the, the varieties, is, John. Yeah. There is quite a lot of varieties. Hmm. Um, now, let me think. Um, Elsom's have one or two. And uh, Syngenta have quite quite a few, and you could get a red cabbage, um, green cabbage, cauliflower, calabrese, and I can't think of any more. But there's quite a few creeping into the marketplace that are club root resistant. Um, getting hold of the seeds another problem because it, I, it's quite expensive and if it's coming from Syngenta even I have to buy a thousand pounds worth of seed at a time um, so 
when you're dealing with organic growers, a, a, a lot of my customers are very small. Um, when you've got to buy a, you know, sort of to 10,000 seed packet, then you're only going to sell a thousand of that particular variety that year. You've got 10 years to hang on to that seed before you get your money back. <laughs> or be by the time you sell it all. So it gets difficult. But moles tend to, oh, kings and moles tend to break up, break up big packets and sell them in smaller quantities. But obviously you pay more then. But there is there is a lot of um club root resistant varieties. There's a lot. Uh, there's quite a selection of club root resistant varieties out there. I vowed never to leave alkaline soil. Mm. And then I'll be all right. Yeah. I hope. Yeah, alkaline soil makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so they tell me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, question here. Click start. What about extending the season earlier in the spring for brassicas, such as spring planted kales? and collards how early would you suggest planting for cropping in e either in tunnels or in fields is early march possible yeah but you'd you you would have to fleece it for two reasons if you plant something in march that's an invitation to the pigeons because that's the first bit of green they've seen all winter um so you've got to put something over the top of it and if you're going to go that early the soil's cold so putting some fleece over it means it warms up quicker and then, then you'll get your crop quicker. So but plant, planting it without any cover on it in March, I, I'd say that was a bit of a, a risk not worth taking. We, um, we don't plant any brassicas until the second week of April um, mm. or the third week of April. And uh, so the kale and tender stem will go out second third week of april and it'll be under fleece but we'll hold back a few thousand plants to plant in between the tomatoes so in a tunnel we'll have tomatoes down the side and then a big kind of i know two and a half meters down the middle uh, which will plant to kale and that'll give us a good two three week uh, head start on the outdoor crop hmm. sounds reasonable yeah but I, i've got customers who plant Cavalier near uh, right the way up. This is in a greenhouse, right the way up to early December, and then start again um, mid January. Wow! So the, the, there's nothing wrong with doing it. Um, it. Just you probably wait a long time for it to get ready, but he does it. He's he's continuously doing all sorts of things like that for salad for salad packs. All oh. right. So yeah, um, this is going back, back, back to the club route. Jamie Stroud says, red cabbages, Ladero. There was a bit of a lack of good winter cabbages. I think that's in terms of uh, club root resistant um, varieties um, that yeah. he could find, but. Yeah, red cabbage, Ladero, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, we we'll keep your questions coming. I think there's there's we we, we haven't got many in the question in the Q and A. Um, Liz, are there? I can't quite see the chat. Are there a bit some questions that come through to the chat chat by, but um, that I can that need to be aired? Yeah, there's one from. Um, well, there have been a few that have been kind of answered. I think um, the one about seed saving. And where does that come in the process? Um, weeding and late crop quality. What are your opinions on that from Toby? That's Jesse's. Uh, well, I mean, we kind of abandoned, we stopped weeding uh, pretty much the middle of September because any weeds that can survive under the brassicas at that stage will probably be very useful suppressing compaction in the pathways or um, improving the soil. So yeah, I mean, brassicas, they're the, 
they're the they're the monster compete competitors, aren't they? I mean, I'm always when a season like this, when you you have all this ambition to under sew with clover, and then the brassicas are given such amazing weather, the brass the clover can't actually establish well enough. So you kind of you go into the next year thinking, well, I'm gonna sow the clover earlier and um, do my last hoeing in um I know the first week, the sec first, second week of August. But um, obviously the brass for growth was so vigorous at that stage, especially if you're irrigating, then it kind of outcompeted any opportunity for the clover to establish. Or I could use vetch. We can have these organic green, uh, green manure chats now. Yeah. So keep your questions coming to the q and if, um, if um, or Jess, have you got a, you had some questions yesterday that you were you were um, keen to ask uh, ask to John? Can you uh, remember? What well, you I mean, I think he's answered my um, my 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 question on uh, preferred Savoy. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I I find it interesting that he um, that he's completely. Uh, you're completely F1, John, because obviously well, I, I think, I'll I think grow all the, the... <laughs> I grow what the customer wants. But yeah. um, in, in yeah. my head, if anybody's asking me, um, I'm going F1 because there's such a selection of good quality varieties. And, um, you know, we, we talked about tender stem yesterday and you said that you because tender stem, if you want to grow tender stem, yeah. And it has you have to purchase the rights from the people who invented tender stem, whereas yeah. my pro propagator gives me versions of tender stem, which are yeah. which, which have got names like the uh, sticoli and tender sticks, um, mm -hmm. but they all come from the kind of Italian chema de wrapper mixture of scrap yeah, yeah. kale yeah. and and this um, any, anything that bolts early but doesn't kind of go to flower too quickly. Yeah. Um, and that 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 lends itself to the open pollinated varieties that say real seeds do. They've always been doing those kind of open pollinated yeah. types. But you, for, for me, it's all about the more you water these things, then the more that they will um, respond in kind. And as soon as it goes, you, you go dry, then it gets woody, and then you lose out an opportunity. Um, and I'm my journey with tender stem. It, is, is young it, this is um i'm only just starting out on it um but i I'm, I'm i'm quite excited to see where it all goes um and how much i can get off each plant <laughs> there, are, there is um some calabrese varieties that behave like tender stem as well such as right. sipsy such as sipsy um sipsy. It, yeah it, it produces uh heads about that big right um lots of them especially if you break the main head out early then you get lots of shoots coming out from the leaf joints with heads on about that big right. and there's there's a lot of other varieties coming through um that's sipsy is a seminus variety uh claws have got a lot nickerson's there, 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 there's quite a movement in that direction. Small, small calibre shaped heads, as opposed yeah. to ten. As opposed to, it's not a true tender stem, because the tender stem is a. I think it's a cross between a Chinese veg and a um, a calibre, isn't it? Um, yes, Kalan, isn't it? Yeah, Kalan. Yeah, Kalan. Yeah. Do, do you have much experience of Chinese cabbage, John? Um, the cabbage or the Chinese cabbage a bit and um, pak choys and stuff like that. I grow right. quite a lot of them. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's... We, uh, schedule, we schedule in Bilko um, in the, the late January, in the late July planting, but I, I kind of mix them with the salads, with the lettuce yeah. Um, yeah. And, and fennel at that stage. Yeah. Uh, but um, they're a nightmare to um, sequence as well because it, summer like this, they all get massive and then 
if it gets they get too hot they actually cook inside the head it right. seems yeah yeah uh, i've always got people trying to grow them early and they bolt if you do it too early yeah then yeah. they need they need a lot of heat in propagation to, to even sort of slow the bolt down i um, grew um i grew the second year running a, a red version and i'm no longer gonna bother because it's clearly very exciting it's pink it's really interesting yeah. but uh, I had a lot of tip burn, it seemed, this year. Yeah. Red, yeah, Chinese cabbage tip burns. It, in, in propagation, it, it hates nitrogen, uh, sorry, nitrogen, nitrogen in the form of ammonia, um, which in organic fertilisers, you get a certain amount of ammonia release. Mm. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I, 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 I'm... I do do it, but it's it's carefully, carefully, if you see what I mean. And I won't be growing them in modules. I'll be growing them in blocks because there's not there's hardly any root system to them. Right. Um, so, but you, as you get later in the season, they get easier. Yeah. So by the time you institute planting in July and August, um, you can there's enough root on them to pull the plant out of a module and put it in the ground and not run the risk of it bolting. So, but but very popular try... in Germany, Chinese cabbage, but yeah. Um, there's um, quite a, there's a comment here, which I, I, I think is quite interesting. We're coming towards the end, the comment, and then there's a question. So there's, um, um, so we're back onto the sort of tender stem. Uh, and Jamie Stroud says, we haven't done much with tender stem, but we've grown I think it's it Montano or Monclano? Monclano. Monclano. Monclano is club root resistant uh, calabrese. Calabrese, yeah. And then so that produces a fairly good yield of secondary florets. One observation I made is it, it's harder for caterpillars to disappear into the small florets than the big heads. Yeah, small. that's a good that one is. because yeah, I have yeah. Ruined, my re ruined my reputation. <laughs> with, ruined my reputation with children because of the green mm. caterpillar, which oh, is the less it's or greater what cabbage one, that one gets in there, and then you you see these caterpillars falling out of your steamed broccoli on the plate. <laughs> <laughs> Puts them off for life. Yeah, another yes. reason to go for a stem over a curd. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. Uh, that's very good. Yeah, I've had um, that happen. <laughs> It, it and, does, uh, upset, does upset people. <laughs> oh, we've got some more questions. I don't know whether we're going to be able to try and just just see, just have a few minutes to see if we can get through through these. Yeah. So a um, few brief answers. Um, so, Jim, any sign of novel winter crops in the pipeline as Colette's were? I mean, you touched it on it a bit, uh, John, maybe, but uh, anything else around coming through that you know of? Not really, but they, they gradually keep getting better and a little bit later and nobody's making any big steps forward yet, but they're, they're gradually itching forward. Let's put it that way. A yellow cauliflower, please. <laughs> I don't, there, I don't there is. There are no, some. no. Is there? There is, oh, God. There is a, um, I seem to remember an orange... Romanesque, right, right, uh, niche, niche, and yeah. and difficult to grow and doesn't behave itself in the field it, when it's too hot. It doesn't get ready all at the same time. It gets ready when it feels like it. One here, one there, one you know. But it's orangish. <laughs> <laughs> Question here from Simon: Have you tried Kybrook? Uh, yeah, I, I have a, a few years ago, and um, again, it's uh, it's it's like a, it throws up lots of small head shoots. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a it's a sprouting broccoli calabrese, but it's very mm. fine, which is mm. fine as long as you have. But the the thing about fine shoots, lots of thin shoots, is they don't actually have such a long shelf life. And so that's why you want to go for pencil thickness um, as a kind of minimum. Okay. Um, and any thoughts on kohlrabi successions and varieties? 
Whoa. No, I don't grow kohlrabi yet. Um, I, if I were to grow kohlrabi, I would have it in my early schedule. Uh, and because I know it grows incredibly quickly and you can have it for early June when you don't have much other stuff. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, I'm, yeah. It's like I a do. turnip. It's just, it's just, it's a turnip, isn't it? Really, it just tastes like a turnip. I, I, but it looks pretty. It looks interesting. Maybe I should, I should not say it. Just, just turn it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that in Germany. It's very, very popular. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> and people eat it like apples. It kind of, my, yeah. So it's a uh, kind of, it's uh, um, you'd have to have a a good range of varieties here to to keep your, yeah. your customers happy. But. Uh, um okay uh john do you have anything to add on that on call oh only grow it if you could sell it yeah yeah that's it that's it mm -hmm. yeah. find out if you could sell it first because yeah and any it. experience with um chimney wrapper and what planting dates would you recommend for production right into the winter uh, not sure what it is but go on tell me well, it's just that tender stem stuff, the unimproved yeah. version. So okay. it's just the Italian one. So you, you just treat it like your other cow breezes. And I'm sure that, yeah, I'm sure that, yeah, you just plant it as late as mid-August, I guess. But you probably get a better established plant. The more root system and more established the plant is, the more it can throw up shoots. So if you can get it in by for mid-July, the better. But you just got to look after it so it doesn't get stressed and get aphid and whitefly and get too big and it has enough space around it to to occupy uh and then it'll be good good um go with that. Go with that. great uh lizzie have we missed have we missed anything um do you know of yeah it's everything yeah that's everything Okay, brilliant. I know somebody made a comment that well, I think the um, the list I sent through from Jez, I must have only sent through one page. So I will I will provide that um, when I do do the recording. I will send a message to all all participants and and all the links that I've included in the chat will include in there, including the um, the pl Jez's planting plant, planting list with um, with both pages. So um, you'll you'll all all be able to look at that at your at your leisure and so yeah i just like to say really thank you thank you very much to 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 both to both of you john and, and to jez it's been been re really really in interesting and fascinating fascinating e evening and um i just um to say i hope to everybody well thank you for participating and um, thank you all for your questions and we hope that we will be back in some form with some webinars we need to apply for some more funding from Farming the Future um, when the next round comes. But even so, the OGA might um, be carrying on with with webinars in 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 any any case if we if we can. So do do if you have topics, keep them coming to us, and we'll see see what we can do to um, to provide um, um, some topics of uh, are what you want to to know about. So um, in the so it, and until then um we we will we'll see you we'll see you again and i hope that uh, you all have um, great christmases and you've all got some some brussels sprouts that have managed to um avoid manage... the green, <laughs> green flyer yeah. avoid yeah avoid avoid all all the pests and uh, <laughs> are as a good um good good size to pick for pick for christmas and um yeah so thanks again and um um, happy Christmas to to everybody, and um, see you all soon. Okay. See you yeah, soon. cheers, guys. Cheers. Yeah, you beautiful Good. growers. <laughs> Carry on the hard work. Good luck.